Thank you. All right, so uh, the, the meta-analysis that, that Dr. Gibbons mentioned is actually published. It's in the uh, interdisciplinary journal Problem-Based Learning. And you'll see a glorious self-citation in this work. And, and we're taking a bit of a twist on that and progressing on to um, the role of tutors in terms of student learning outcomes um, with this particular piece. And this is currently uh, under review. I, I, should, I, f I feel the need to explain this exceedingly verbose title here. So uh, both of these presentations uh, originated um, at AERA. So this is one that was already presented, the meta-analysis one that was already presented at AERA. And the professional development work that I'll describe a bit later is yet to be presented this spring. So shameless plug there. Um, and, you know, AERA titles, are, AERA titles are famous for having colon titles, being hideously long, and yeah. So that, that's what I was going for. And plus, I had to throw in soup, so why not use Bouillabaisse in, in the title? All right, so uh, again, this is about expert versus novice, novice tutors um, in, in the area of meta-analysis. How many of you have read a meta-analysis before, out of curiosity? Good, so fair, fair number of you. Uh, so as a problem statement here, um, in, in the PBL literature, uh, there's a distinct lack of empirical work in terms of what actually happens with the tutor role, but a lot of people are perfectly willing to pontificate about what they think should happen. So there are, for instance, uniform calls to engage uh, in, in training your tutors, which makes a tremendous amount of sense. This is a difficult uh, transition for them to make from uh, being the primary source of information to being more of a facilitator or guide. Um, there's conflicting advice in terms of content expertise. In fact, within some of the, the uh, most famous people in this area, Howard Barrows in particular, their opinion has migrated over time from uh, we absolutely need content expertise to perhaps this is a bit secondary and, and all kinds of flavors in between. There's a huge volume of primary literature here um, and associated with that several different meta-analyses, and we'll get a more in-depth look at what those are. Uh, but nobody has tackled this idea of uh, specifically looking at tutor impacts in the context of a meta-analysis. So uh, probably helps to define what problem-based learning is. Uh, the idea is you first uh, engage the students in a problem before you uh, uh, lecture to them or have them do extensive reading in an area the idea being they're going to be uh, much more in tune with that new content knowledge they acquire if it's in pursuit of finding a problem solution than if they just read something, say, devoid of context. Uh, those problems need to be authentic or reflective of uh, a real life, uh, eventual professional practice, and they need to be ill-structured, representing the complexity that you would find in real life. And this is maybe a bit of a departure from something like model-centered learning, uh, where you would start them with a denatured model and maybe have them play with just a portion of what's going on and add that complexity over time. Uh, it's fundamentally student-centered, so students are taking responsibility for uh, where they're headed. There's a bit of a misconception here in which people think, um, oh, well, they're, you know, the inmates are running the asylum. How are they going to uh, get the, the learning targets that they want? That actually feeds back into the problems that you're selecting for them. If they're finding viable solutions for those problems, they should be hitting that, that content that's uh, critical or that you've identified as being critical for them. But what they're actually doing is they're taking ownership over what are the specific gaps in their knowledge. What do they currently know that will help them solve that problem? What do they need to go and find out to help them find that solution? Again, tutors are acting as facilitators or groups or, uh, or guides. And uh, typically, you do this with small group learning. So in 2002, um, Barrows softened from saying this always has to happen in terms of small groups to this usually happens in, in small groups. And it's not clear if he's giving a nod to the many variations of problem-based learning. Um, uh, although if, if he started down that road, all of this stuff would be up for debate. But uh, yeah, so as, as a consequence in our meta-analysis, we were willing to include studies um, that, that were engaging students one-on-one -on -one with the learning materials. Uh, which is no small amount of controversy when you start talking with, with uh, people in this area that do work in this area. Uh, okay, so moving on to the existing meta-analyses. Um, this is actually just a sampling. There's a couple others out there. Uh, Barneveld and Strobel, uh, that's actually not a meta-analysis. It's a meta-synthesis where they're grabbing... Oh, sorry, yeah. I wanted to go back to your comment about the small group. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, yeah. So is that, what it, why? Is that because they consider learning, like, social in nature, thus the small group, or is it reflective of the real world practices? Where, where is the rub? Yeah, from, from the outset, Barrels always described this as happening in small groups. In fact, they would talk about small group sessions for PBL, right. in which the facilitator is asking these metacognitive questions. Uh, it, I mean, it's built into so many other facets, not necessarily the collaboration point. In fact, um, Lori, Lori Nelson, if you guys are familiar with her, her work, wrote a, a separate piece on collaborative learning and problem-based learning, uh, collaborative problem-based learning, with the idea that there's a distinction between those, those two things. But, um, you know, as, as part of this, uh, this group work, once you identify knowledge goals, you engage in this, this uh, misnomer, I call it, of collaborative independent study where the group as a whole has identified their knowledge gaps, and then individuals go out and pursue those and return and report to the group. Another feature where that would come back into play is um, this, this idea of peer review, where they're critically assessing the, the knowledge that, that each group member has obtained. So, I mean, there's, there's uh, consequences for, for bagging the small group work in which you, know, you need to uh, ramp up this idea of reflection and, and uh, have some mechanisms in place that individuals are engaging in some of those tasks on their, on their own. Thanks. Yeah, great question. I'm sorry, I, I need to look up at the, at the audience more here. All right, so in terms of the existing meta-analyses, uh, again, uh, Barneveld and Strobel are uh, kind of summarizing all of the existing meta-analytic reviews, and, uh, and they've largely found what, what um, each of the existing reviews uh, found on their own, which is PBL tends to do quite well when you're engaged in more complex forms of assessment. So as you're asking students to apply their knowledge, draw connections between uh, disparate pieces of information, uh, and tends to do uh, early on, uh, so Albanese and Mitchell and Vernon and Blake found that these outcomes were much worse in terms of learning uh, facts or, uh, or rote knowledge. And, uh, and then later on, subsequent reviews as the body of literature started to expand and as we started to go into uh, multiple disciplines, um, that it was about the same in terms of, and this is, by the way, a comparison between lecture-based approaches and problem-based approaches. Okay, uh, one, one other interesting thing to note, um, so Dochi et al. Uh, was the only uh, current, currently published meta-analysis that looked at study quality. So this is the quality of the research design. Uh, and there's a lot of complicated stuff going on in, in the PBL research. So people use historical controls where maybe they had a lecture-based medical school for 10 years. They made a switch to PBL, and they're comparing that with student outcomes in their PBL curricula for the next three. And as you can imagine, this is all sorts of bad in terms of research design. Uh, so they, they took a detailed look at um, all of that complexity as it kind of emerges from the PBL literature. And they decided, you know what, there's not big differences among these studies. So for perhaps justifiable reasons, other people, including myself, did not necessarily look at study quality uh, since. Um, but we did for this study, and we found some interesting uh, things as kind of a teaser. No, another thing I should mention is that the, uh, boy, I feel like I'm self-plugging here quite a bit, but the, uh, our, our meta-analysis was kind of the first to branch out beyond medical education in a substantive way. Right, so this is, um, and, and meta is kind of where PBL originated, at least the form advocated by Barrows. Uh, but nobody had, had really incorporated that literature. Dochi and Hibbles et al. Uh, made a really valiant effort at that, but they, they weren't necessarily characterizing that, that work. Okay, so again, uh, just to, to review here, uh, there's a bit of a, a mixed claims in terms of what you need for tutor expertise. Some are arguing that you need content experts. Uh, some argue that it's uh, secondary, although they started off arguing that it's highly critical. And then some argue that uh, expertise is perhaps unnecessary and may even get in the way of being an effective facilitator. So it remains an empirical question, you know, whether or not that's true. They all, there's uniform agreement about training being uh, important. So as they, as they do this role switch, uh, you really need to, to be looking at these things. In terms of research questions, this is fairly straightforward. We just want to determine whether or not background makes a difference on student learning, uh, whether training makes a difference, and then is there an interaction between these two when you start to meld them together. Okay, so for research uh, methods, big thing with meta-analysis is 
uh, literature, uh, how, how you're defining your literature search. So we looked at all the places that the PBL literature tends to be found. Um, by the way, there's a ton of dissertations in this area. Um, so that's, and, and they tend to be uh, very uh, rich areas to do meta-analysis in because they're one of the few places where you actually have the space to detail the measures that you used and, and the exact procedures that you went through. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Other than, I should mention, uh, we obviously looked for primary research referrals. So when a study mentioned other work that did problem-based learning and, and cited it to support their own efforts, we went and investigated and see if they had codable results. And we also did an author survey. So of all the studies that we coded, we contacted those uh, primary study authors, asked them to fill in some of the gaps um, where, you know, a funny thing about this area, there's, um, there's quite a bit of missing information, especially in the journal articles. In medical education, I've seen um, articles that are literally like a quarter of a page in length. That's the entire study. So you get uh, maybe the N, you get a sense of what measures they were using, but there's, there's a lot left up, um, a lot of gaps left to fill. All right, uh, for inclusion criteria, they needed to meet the uh, PBL definition that I threw up there. Uh, earlier, um, they needed to uh, be looking at outcomes that were, uh, the great reason to start off here is this is what policymakers care about. When you start talking about um, attitudes, um, a lot of over and they just don't care. And I think we're at the point now where we've proved that this assists student learning enough that we can get to those. In fact, I'll, I'll make a nod to some of the work that we're, uh, or actually my doc student is doing currently along those lines, but you kind of need to, to prove at least no harm and, and possibly lots of benefit before you start talking about some of these other things. All right, and then uh, again, you need to be looking at a control treatment versus a problem-based learning treatment in order to get into our particular study. So we used Cohen's D as our primary uh, effect size calculation. There's a couple different possibilities. Um, and he, he kind of split this world with a nod to this being ex exceedingly complex into uh, three levels. 0.2 would be a small effect size, 0.5, and, and I should take a, a step back here and say perhaps something that a real expert in that discipline, so a PBL expert would be able to look at two different sets of students and say, uh, or actually more to the point with what we're looking at here, an expert in that content area would be able to look at two different student performances and say, okay, this one is clearly doing better than this, this other student. Um, obviously blind to treatment. Uh, 0.5 would be a medium effect size, and 0.8 would be quite large, right? So somebody who maybe doesn't have content expertise would be able to look at two student performances and say, there's something markedly better about this person. All right, so we have a fairly complex coding scheme. I'm actually gonna talk a bit about uh, the analysis and pop back and, and go back and forth between our coding scheme and our results here. So as a first step to account for the rather large variance in individual study findings, um, we converted Cohen's D to Hedges G. And then to assure that we had kind of a representative uh, group, and of course we're going for complete coverage, but we're trying to determine if there's um, sort of some sort of an existing bias in the literature. We plotted, we did a funnel plot, and we also did a classic fail-safe N. So we found differences in favor of PBL, um, and and although there's some issues with the classic fail-safe N, we need around 1,200 outcomes at uh, zero differences in order to uh, kind of void those um, those findings favoring PBL. So it's it's a pretty good. Uh, indicator that um, that we're finding in favor of PBL here. All right, so back to this coding scheme. The first thing we did was we looked at research design, and this is this is a recommendation outside the PBL literature and outside the group of folks who've done meta-analysis in this specific discipline. All right, and uh, and they recommend parsing this this space into actually more than we have represented here. They're just those didn't exist in this literature. So the first split is a true random design. This is about assignment of individuals. Uh, the next one is a group random where maybe you have several intact classes. You're gonna need to have three in order to play in this group random space. And then you randomly assign those intact classes to groups. And this is a fairly common thing in educational uh, research. Much more common is obviously the non-equivalent control group design, right? So this is, um, I don't know, the virus of educational research that 
spreads wide and rampant. And there's really good reasons for this, right? You know, it's always a trade-off between uh, research validity and ecological validity, and, and I'm not disparaging non-equivalent control group design uh, research at all. I'm just saying that that's where the vast bulk of these findings were. And you can kind of see that um, here. Um, now, I, I had a colleague mention that uh, it's always difficult to define things in terms of an absence, so maybe instead of non-equivalent control group design, we should use something like a quasi-experimental design, uh, which is the switch that you see here. Uh, and this is the total number of outcomes. I think we had uh, slightly over 80 studies total. Uh, and of course, there's, there tend to be multiple outcomes from individual studies. Another decision in meta-analysis is, is uh, you know, what is your unit of analysis per se? These outcomes tend to be so different that it would be less meaningful to aggregate them according to a single study, where maybe one test is looking at factual knowledge. A great example of this would be uh, step one of the USMLE medical licensure exam uh, versus step two uh, where they're getting at those interconnections and step three where they're looking at how well the med students can apply their knowledge. Uh, right, so we made a decision to use outcome as the unit of analysis uh, and a huge, obviously, chunk of these studies fall into quasi-experimental design. Now one big takeaway we had here, and you can see the huge jump in terms of random designs being much, much higher than the quasi-experimental work, was it's probably not meaningful to come up with a single aggregate effect size outcome across all these studies. So we made the decision going forward, and you may have noticed this was not necessarily one of our research questions. This was us kind of exploring this space and, and determining that it was meaningful to combine these. Uh, we made the decision that that's not indeed the case. We're going to, uh, so from here on out, we parse these findings into uh, these various research designs um, because they're so markedly different from one another. Now, the only pairwise difference between these two um, is uh, that random, uh, true random designs uh, perform significantly better than the group random all. Uh, the, the boxes around the, uh, the effect size estimate here indicate that it's significantly different than zero. And I should mention in terms of the visualization here, this is uh, just a scale of the effect size uh, ranges that we saw. And, uh, and the diamonds here, midpoint indicates the effect size estimate. The points of the diamond indicate a confidence, 95% confidence interval. So you get a sense for uh, you know, how much uh, variability is there in these individual findings, and it stands to reason that this point estimate is much more precise for the quasi-experimental all, where you have such a huge, overwhelming number of outcomes. Yeah? Can you tell, define it again, what a group random all is? Yeah. So, so the all, you should maybe leave off. This is uh, looking forward to when we start to break these things out within in the category. But group random means uh, the, for the, the uh, assignment in the specific study, they had intact classrooms, three or more, that were randomly assigned as intact groups to either PBL. So the random all is individuals were randomly assigned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were no pre-existing groups for those. And you can see it's quite rare, right, for reasons that are common for educational research to have true random and designs. And so group random all differ from quasi-experimental? Well, the quasi-experimental, you'd only have two intact groups that you're assigning. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Behind the scenes, there's actually statistical uh, means in which uh, the group random all might wind up being equivalent to random if you did something like a, an HLM analysis and, and put those uh, pre-existing group differences into the mix. So that was, that was part of our coding scheme, but we didn't actually run into any instances of, of somebody doing those analyses in the PBL literature. Okay, so on to tutor background. So this is a bit more of the meat here. We coded uh, content expert, content novice, uh, mixed, in which they had a mixture of, of expert and novice or unspecified. And kind of behind the scenes here, uh, it's, it's really difficult given what they've provided uh, to, to make meaningful judgments. So we kind of had to go with what they gave us, which was typically we had faculty doing the tutoring or we had students. And our, our final judgment, because we ranged this from medical education down to, I think there was a study that did PBL in kindergarten, um, is, is the tutor at least one degree level higher than the student? So a graduate student as a tutor for an undergrad class would classify as a quote unquote content expert tutor. 
This gets messy, right? Because uh, one of the arguments for PBL is that this tends to be cross, or you want the problems to be cross-disciplinary, meaning that somebody may be an expert in one area and not in another. But this was the, the slice of the pie that we could make. Uh, so taking a look at these findings, again, broken out by those different research designs, um, not a whole lot of surprises here in terms of background. Okay, there's a few things that are standing out, but in, in large part, they tend to parallel these research designs. So the content experts from the quasi-experimental world did, uh, uh, on a pairwise comparison, better than the quasi-experimental content experts, but you know, we found that in terms of the research design. Is it really that surprising in terms of content expertise? Um, we did see some variations here, but it's unclear if that's due to content novices doing markedly better or quasi-experimental designs being better than the group random designs. And I'll just blow through these um, quickly because they tend to, again, parallel those same sets of findings. On to tutor training, we coded it in one of three potential ways, but there were, you know, operationally only two. Uh, the first was that they specifically said, yes, we engaged in some form of training. And again, this gets messy as well, because that could have been anything from a day to, um, you know, an extensive. And then we know this from the PD literature, it's best to have sustained um, interventions, but they may have gone for an entire year with uh, peer observations and review of exactly what they're doing as, as tutors. Um, nobody uh, specified that they did not, specifically did not train their tutors, which makes a bit sense given the uniform recommendations in the literature, but our guess is that there's some number, some unspecified number that did not engage in training. And then uh, a huge chunk of the, of the authors did not specify either way in terms of training. You kind of see that break out here. No, no, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't because there was so little reporting. I mean, I'm literally mentioning a handful of studies now in terms of that big <coughs> comparison. Usually all they'd say is, yes, we did some form of training, but not specifying exactly what that meant. Uh, all right, so uh, again, there's a, there's a pretty good chunk of unspecified here um, and not necessarily uh, big outcomes that stand out. So, you know, once more we have this parallel between random outcomes and quasi-experimental where random is doing much better in terms of trained tutors. Um, yeah, and then differences between unspecified and quasi-experimental, yes, but it's unclear if that's due to random or uh, differences between random and group random. Um, we do start to see some interesting things when we look at the mix of these two. So heading into um, this nasty, huge combination table, uh, first thing to point out, there's, uh, there's several uh, here that are fairly low end, including the, this, this change here is to denote a point estimate where we only had a single outcome as opposed to the diamonds, which represent some sort of aggregate finding. Um, yeah, there's several that have, we have very low data for, um, including some that show uh, you know, a bit of promise, such as uh, in random designs, an unspecified background with training did, uh, did fairly well, significantly different than zero at 0.374, but it's not, um, there's not enough uh, information here to start drawing a ton of pairwise differences uh, between other studies. Um, there are some things that get a little bit interesting. Some of these are the, the parallels we've been seeing before. Um, I'm going to jump forward here and we'll get to in quasi-experimental all. So this is one of the few spaces where we've got enough studies to start getting down to uh, you know, pairwise differences within a single kind of research design. So we have this huge volume of these non-equivalent control group or quasi-experimental designs, and we actually find a difference between training here for content experts. So it appears to be um, particularly efficacious, at least in this research design, uh, for, uh, for folks who have expertise in that discipline. And, and honestly, this is, um, you know, you don't see a whole lot of this necessarily in educational research. Uh, 
of a 0.23 effect size difference, as some disciplines you do. And we see the same thing here for content novices, where the training appears to work quite well for uh, content novices. This is even more marked at a 0.43 difference. Um, and again, you see this in uh, random design um, comparisons. And this is, this is interesting because our, our number of outcomes here is quite small. We only have nine um, trained content experts and seven untrained content experts, and we still find this pairwise difference between the two. All right, so in terms of conclusions, yikes, I'm, I'm late on time here. Um, there's uh, probably one of the biggest takeaways from this, uh, this research is this departure uh, from some pretty heavy-handed claims uh, extant to the literature. Not, I mean, Dochi uh, was, this again, this meta-analysis who, who found no big differences between these uh, different flavors of research design. Um, but when they were, uh, Colliver in particular, uh, is a bit disparaging on the PBL literature and, and looked at a handful of studies that did uh, true experimental designs versus these uh, quasi-experimental designs so rife in, in education lit and, and said, you know what, I, I'm looking at these handful of studies. Again, Colliver was not making claims at being comprehensive. And I'm finding that when we do these true experimental designs, it does not favor problem-based learning. And our results are, are uh, quite the contrary, that when we, we go and, and try to be more comprehensive, um, we, we find something uh, quite a bit different. Uh, so moving on to content expertise, I would say there's not necessarily uh, support for it being critical. Right? We did not find a smoking gun in which these, uh, these content expert tutors did markedly better than, uh, the, say, the mixed tutors or the novice tutors. And this is kind of an exciting finding, honestly, and I'll maybe summarize that a bit down the road. Um, and there's, there's perhaps support, but uh, of course you never really do this in ed research. There's support, but no uh, uh, definitive claims for this idea of content expertise being secondary or perhaps not necessary in the context of PBL. Now, in terms of training, um, again, nothing at first glance, but when we start to uh, uh, throw this into the mix with uh, research design and background, we saw those differences that I pointed out. Or in certain instances, um, there are pairwise differences between, say, content novices who received and did not receive training, or had unspecified training, I should say. Uh, and this is maybe another big, big difference or thing to discuss here. Um, you know, we've got this, this issue of people either identified tutors as being trained or they did not necessarily specify. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of overlap here, right, where some number of that unspecified group actually did engage in training and just didn't mention it in the article. So any differences we find here are, are actually quite surprising, um, given that undetermined amount of overlap between, uh, between interventions on, on at least that particular dimension. Okay, so some, some limitations that need to be discussed here. Uh, Meta-analysis comes with its own baggage, um, obviously leaving out uh, quite a bit of uh, literature, especially on the qualitative uh, end of the world. Um, I already mentioned the content expertise and training as binary instead of reflecting any of that um, inherent complexity or difference in terms of what training means. The author survey response rate that we had was exceedingly small, so 35%. Uh, a lot of that is due to some of this literature being over 20 years old. I can't imagine pulling open my drawer and, and answering people's questions about, um, say, the mean squares within that I had on an ANOVA I ran 20 years ago. I tend to be a digital pack rat, so maybe I'd have that. Um, and uh, the, the effect size differences between these are a little bit marked, where those who responded um, had you know, 0.36 almost versus 0.21 for our, our mean effect. Uh, all right, so some final thoughts. We obviously need a lot more uh, reporting of what's going on within these, these studies. And you really can't fault the authors here. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure quite a few in this room have, have submitted journal articles. You're always, space is always a premium. And how much do you need 
uh, to devote to describing exactly what kind of training when that's necessar not necessarily at the heart and soul of what you're doing. So one possibility here is to come up with a taxonomy of uh, you know, tutor features, right, in which somebody could quickly say, I'm using uh, this flavor of content expert, I'm doing this kind of training, and devote maybe a single sentence or maybe with the quarter page uh, research study in, in medical education, a single word, to the kind of tutor that they're using. Um, pretty, pretty decent takeaway for practitioners, which is always a good thing to, to be paying attention to in terms of meta-analysis, is you know, there's, there's uh, support, or at least you're not going to be detracting from your findings if you use content novices or a mixture of content novices and content experts. And this is nice because faculty are spendy. I, I never see any of that money, but um, yeah, we tend to be much more spendy than, than students. Um, and there's support that training may indeed help. And this, this makes sense. Mouse et al. Uh, was, was reporting on observations of what facilitators did in their actual uh, sessions after receiving training, and they found that faculty in particular tended to engage in lecture. You know, we've had this this PBL session, and I'm really nervous about you being ready for this licensure exam, so now I'm going to tell you what you need to do, or need to know in order to pass this exam, kind of usurping the whole thought behind problem-based learning. So any, any questions on the meta-analysis? I've got a whole 10 minutes to talk about the professional development here. Yeah, Charles. Uh -huh. um, there's been a move uh, in the last decade or two in the training of teachers to increase the level of content expertise that they have by giving them methods classes that involve teaching content as well as methods, whether it's using PBL or not. Uh -huh. What I kind of hear you saying is um, your data show that the content expertise is not as important as you thought it might have been. Yeah, for facilitating PBL. Now, it may well be, I, I would be the first one to tell you, it's probably not a good idea, and of course Barrows would be the first one to tell you it is, to use PBL throughout your whole curriculum. So Barrows' argument is if you go back and forth between, say, lecture and PBL, uh, you're going to kind of have this epistemological head spin among your students in which they don't know necessarily which way is up. I would argue, um, especially in K-12 settings, this, this really is probably not um, the, the single solution in terms of uh, what you're doing with your, your students. So um, I, I would say maybe it doesn't matter in terms of PBL, but it may well be critical when you go back to, say, direct instruction or or other more traditional forms of, of educational interventions. Um, yeah? But evaluating student work and their response to this stuff, would it be to... So the facilitator is more than a facilitator in a group setting. They're also the evaluator, <coughs> typically. Well, it depends, actually. So in a lot of these studies, you'd be taking these standardized measures. They wouldn't necessarily be evaluating. Some of the evaluation tasks might be taken on by peers. Some of it might be taken on by instructor. And some of it may indeed be taken on by the facilitator. So yeah, there's, I mean, this is a messy, messy space. And you kind of see um, all different approaches to evaluation in particular. Yep, other, other questions? Yeah. Um, so I have a couple, but I'll just maybe start with this one. Maybe I'll stop too much of this. But so that messiness, um, well, I mean, how does that make you view this whole endeavor? Uh -huh. You know, I mean, for some could look at that and say, that is so messy. And I'm used to doing really tight, rigorous things that I just can't really interpret these data. It's especially at this higher aggregate level, I mean, you're going, or abstract level, I mean, you're getting a couple levels above the individual study. Sure. Here. I mean, what kind of, why do you have confidence in that? Yeah, I mean, I mean you're right. It's absolutely a, a hugely messy space. I think it's good for broad strokes, right? It's part of With so broad, how does it refer to anything that's... Right, so with, with that mess, I think it's amazing that you're finding these differences, right? If there's, if there's some hidden... We don't know what they mean. That's the whole point. That was the first part of the question. The, the, the differences that we don't know how to interpret, and it goes so abstract, I guess it's like there's two problems there that are sort of intertwined. 
Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to Yeah, yeah. No, no, this is a common critique to meta-analysis, right? It's, it's commonly phrased as a landscape critique, that there are, there's huge variations within individual studies that I'm grouping together. Um, so what confidence do you have that, um, you know, any of those aggregate... Um, I don't even know what they mean. I mean, I'm just still at the level of meaning. I mean, how do you even make sense of them? Yeah. Them start to make click value claims about what people should do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you either believe it or you don't, right? Yeah, so you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm guessing you stand in the in the realm of I'm I'm not well, believing the that. The argument that persuade me, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's a genuine question. Okay, so can I ask you another? Sure. Slightly different? Yeah. I mean, this is you did a lot of really technical um, expertise here. This is great. I mean, I'm glad that people in the field are learning how to do this. You know, a lot of people say the only way you can really understand an area of research, in some sense, is through meta analysis. And single shot studies never really give you a really good glimpse of things. So mm -hmm. I can understand why we're heading this direction. So that's great. I just a couple of quick. Questions. You had boxes around some of those values in there that you were calling significant. I wondered if you mentioned this, maybe I missed it. Did you talk about um, what significance means here and then uh, maybe technically and then how that got translated into your conclusion at the end? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the boxes around the studies were significantly different from zero. Uh, zero. So how, yep. well, how was that statistic? I mean, is that just like a p value type of exam? Yeah, it's it's an ANOVA comparison between, um, yeah, between those two so values. You said significant. You meant statistically significant, like a, in, in like a traditional piece. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what what about the more practical issue, though, like the practical significance of being? I don't know if you, it seemed like you didn't mention that, but I may have missed it. Yeah, so I'd I'd fall back on Cohen's definition of is this detectable to the casual observer. Um, and, and, you know, that it's, a, it's a great question, you know, what exactly is an, a, 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 an important difference between these? And you're absolutely right. You need to be talking about statistical significance, probably need to be talking about effect size difference, and that does not excuse you. Absolutely. That does not excuse you from meaningfulness of differences. So authors in this space have talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, the Colliver article, for instance, argued for a 2.0 or no, it was, it was citing Bloom, right, and, and said, well, 2.0 is maybe a little bit too strenuous, so I'll do you a solid and say an effect size of 1 is, is a difference big enough for us to go through this, this ardor of implementing problem-based learning. Um, Albanese, on the other end of the scale, said, if we're not finding any effect size differences in terms of knowledge or student learning, that's maybe a good thing, because I am anticipating that we'll find much bigger differences in terms of um, uh, self-directed learning in the student and increased motivation for lifelong learning, because these are other things that PBL espouses. I would say, uh, you know, this, this varies widely by context, right? So you have these different, uh, um, uh, say, the standardized licensure exam, and in some cases, that can mean the difference between somebody passing and not passing the exam with an effect size of 0.2. Right? In other cases, you've got people who had an, exe an, an essay exam where everybody tended to fail the exam, and you had an effect size difference of two, but you have people who failed compared to people who failed at a much better level. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I would say um, moving forward in terms of practical application for people who are consuming this meta-analysis, I would look at what's the, the average level of performance for the measure that you're using. Um, does that fall close to, say, a, a significant criterion? And are they um, getting bumped over that threshold if you're engaged in problem-based learning? Right, very good. Thank you. Yeah, it just, it's just so fascinating to me that all these articles that you cited in your conclusion, too, still appeal to some kind of predetermined sort of meaning-making number. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it seems like we can't, just cannot escape that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, it's... my bias. You know, I, just, I, mean, I question that. Yeah, yeah, and, and to um, be more fair to what the, the quote I put up there from Cohen, he said, you know, this is the social sciences. This yeah, means very different Cohen things and different, and yeah. His theme and his, all that he did. He's dead now. He's at like NYU for all. He's very famous for doing that. Yeah. And so I, I just I go to conferences and people say, well, this is significant now because there's the Cohen value, you know, and I think they're still mm -hmm. not thinking. You know, it's still this knee-jerk use of a number, and I just wonder about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot more going on in this, absolutely. And for the purpose of a presentation, you can only go through uh, so much stuff. Yep. Yeah, great question. Dr. Walker, quick, two quick questions. So of, the, of your study, how many of those were in medical, medical school kinds of studies yeah. versus other disciplines? So can you make any inferences about learning in PBL in outside of, outside of you know, graduate school, medical school, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. From, from yeah, it's a great question about cultural differences. We haven't looked at that, but when you, if you want to look at uh, differences across disciplines, um, go to the IJPBL paper because that's one of the things that we uh, we coded is is are there big differences? And it turns out, yeah, it turns out some of the best findings are not necessarily in medical education, right? So the uh, the effect size point estimate for for med ed is actually a bit lower than other disciplines, and I think uh, engineering came out quite low. I can't remember off the top of my head what some of them were, but teacher education turns out turned out pretty dang good. Um, so as you're as you're doing teacher preparation, um, this, that's a pretty good space to to engage in in problem based learning. It's a great question. Okay, and I think I've got all of five minutes to describe our PD work here. Um, right, so. I, it's kind of a shame that, that I didn't allocate more time to, to get into this, but uh, we're, this actually has a pretty decent connection to some of the work that Charles Graham does. Uh, we're looking at using problem-based learning in the context of teacher professional development. I know uh, Mishra and Kohler, and, uh, and he does uh, quite a bit of work with TPAC, advocate for something called learning by design. I'm going to blow through some of these here. In which you're using problem-based learning uh, to engage... Uh, teachers and design, fundamentally design-oriented tasks. Now, I would argue there's a pretty big departure from what they define as problem-based learning and, and uh, what, say, Barrows uh, advocates for in problem-based learning. Probably the biggest one, this is actually a sin that we commit ourselves in our own work, is uh, you have teachers pick the problems themselves. And this is a great trade-off between authenticity and this idea of having a structured problem for them to engage in. If you take an in-service teacher and say, I'm going to pick a design problem that you have uh, and, and uh, that you might have in your classroom and you miss, they're really going to be hating you because they're spending a ton of time um, trying to, to solve this design problem that has absolutely no meaningful application in their life. Your authenticity has, uh, has, has really dropped significantly for them. We have found um, uh, quite a bit of efficacy in doing the reverse or, or kind of uh, backwards designing from the design problems that teachers bring. So we'll take those and we'll give them to pre-service teachers who maybe don't know as much about the classroom context. And if you ask them to generate their own design problem, they're, um, they're not maybe going to be a, a bit more of a loss. Um, so the uh, outcomes in terms of doing PBL in, in, with uh, teacher preparation are really good. So... Here's, here's this number again, but it's a, a 1.14, um, which Cohen would describe as uh, definitely quite large, and even Colliver would be on board with this being a, a ripe area for doing um, problem-based learning. Uh, and I'm going to blow through a lot of this context piece. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, this is the goo piece. I feel obligated to show this now. So one of the things that we found in, in our workshop is we tried to engage teachers in problem-based learning at the same time that we're learning these technology skills, specifically how, uh, learning how to use this tool called the Instructional Architect, um, and they hated it, right? So their, their first cut through there, they decided this is way too complex. We decided to tease these things two apart and give them an example of what you might do in terms of problem-based learning. So for that example, we had them play this game called World of Goo. Anybody played this? One, Seth. All right, way to represent USU, though. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a series of problems. In fact, it has a bit more in common with, say, model-centered instruction or von Marienbohr's 4CID model because over time you introduce them to uh, other complexities in the space. Right? First, you're just operating with these goo balls that um, attach to each other, and then they start to take on other features, and you start to uh, introduce um, uh, elements that are completely different. Like I think in this next one, they get to take a look at a balloon. Um, but they're borrowing from these, uh, actually that's I think two from, from here on the video. Uh, they're borrowing in the sense that there are these defined structures they can build um, with more or less support. Um, this is definitely ill-structured in the sense that from word go, at least as we present it to them, we don't even necessarily tell them what they're trying to do. 
right? They need to arrive at the goal or figure out the goal that I need to rescue as many of these goo balls as possible. And we get really interesting things going on here. Teachers immediately recognize that this is a highly engaging task. When you ask them to stop and engage in reflection, which we ask them to do as they're going throughout this activity, um, they tend to refuse to do it. And this is a great way to engage teachers and say, you know, if you were using something like in the, this in your classroom, how would you get them to stop? And they'll, they'll say, you know, great things like, well, in my lab, we have the ability to shut down everybody's screen. So every five minutes, I will force them to stop engaging in the game and think about their next step instead of just progressing on. Okay, and we're going to miss our, our balloon here, but... Um, all right, so in terms of research questions, we were kind of curious to, we had, we had two different enactments of the workshop, one in which we um, showed them um, problem-based learning concurrent with these technology skills as advocated by uh, learning by design, and the other in which we followed the recommendations of our participants and teased these apart. So one workshop day was devoted towards technology skills, the next was devoted towards um, problem-based learning. And we just kind of wanted to see um, are they learning, and then are there differences between these two approaches? Um, this is mixed method, although since this is emerging work, uh, the qualitative piece is missing, which part of me really likes. Um, uh, in terms of participants, uh, we had definitely a low end, 18 in our concurrent technology group, 13 in our technology followed by um, PBL. And uh, yeah, I'll just maybe skip to the end here in the interest of time. We found that in terms of technology, the groups did about the same. And then, and that, by the way, this is a self-report of, of um, you know, their knowledge, experience, and attitudes about engaging in technology integration. Um, when, it, when it came to um, problem-based learning, and this was uh, not self-reported, this is how many elements of problem-based learning are they using in their finished instruction with their students, we found a, a decent increase. Um, I think the effect size gain was 0.45. Um, and they, they wound up, um, uh, and this is actually getting back to, uh, to Steve's point, this is critical for effect size differences. They wound up doing fairly poorly uh, in, in terms of problem-based learning with the concurrent setting, and they wound up doing uh, pretty much poorly as well, but uh, with a large effect size gain in terms of um, problem-based learning. So um, it's, it's interesting in the sense that, according to Mishra and Kohler, you know, we should see gains going in the other direction. We should see them uh, showing some market improvement in terms of um, their, uh, what they're doing with technology integration. And much of their work is, tends to be self-report as well. Um, and we should see uh, corresponding gains in terms of what they're doing in terms of pedagogy. Now, there's all kinds of criticisms to this. You know, is it meaningful from the perspective of Mishra and Kohler's work to be assessing these things discreetly, or do they need to be uh, assessed all together. Um, there's a couple other that, is, that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Um, well, one would be, they, they would argue that technology, um, probably less so for their description of learning-based design and more so uh, from the perspective of, um, of, of what they have actually done. So this is less definitional and more descriptive about their own work. They tend to have teachers pursue their own technology skill interests. So they'll sit them down in front of their design problem, and they'll say, OK, I need to learn more about Blackboard. I need to, I need to learn more about PowerPoint, whereas we had a, a technology and a skill set we wanted to convey to them from word go. So there's a, a, no small amount of difference between our sets of work. I would argue this is extremely preliminary, but extremely interesting in that these findings are a bit different than, than what they advocate for. So. Thank you.